Well, so good to see everybody, and uh, I hope you've all had a wonderful Christmas and so on. We got all those formalities out of the way last week, I think. But uh, great to have an online audience with us today as well, wherever you are in the world. Um, and isn't it awesome, guys, to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Um, even for those guys who are online, technically you're also with us. Um, you know, by being in the house, we are actually, whether we like it or not, we just automatically become part of the institution of the kingdom of God. Okay, and for those of you that are followers of Jesus, that comes with the great privilege of eternal life, which is just an amazing thing. And that gives purpose to all of these meetings that we have every Sunday, and it brings a peace and a security to our lives. And, uh, you know, the one Jewish word for that is shalom. I'm sure you all know that, and you know the dynamics of the word shalom. So with that said, I wish you all shalom for this year, for 2023 and onwards. Okay, message. All right, so the series for the month, you guys obviously know, is called Look Up, and uh, this is the second one, I think. Kerry did one last week, which was an awesome one. And the title of this message in the series is called Tracking Jesus, as in following him, but we're going to go into tracking. It's different. All right, so this series uh, generally is all about um, setting up our activities, uh, our prayer lives, our assignments, our ministries, etc., before God uh, for the year ahead, and making sure that we follow Jesus for the entire year, not just January and February and drift off in March onto something else. Okay, and the reason we do this at the beginning of the year, obviously, is because Jesus says that we can do nothing without him. Okay, nothing without him. John uh, 15, here's verse 4 to 7. Verse 4, abide in me and I will abide in you. So the biblical context of abide is to um, remain or to continue. Okay, so it's not a, an obnoxious thing, I can't abide that person. Okay, it's like abide means to remain in Jesus or remain in the Lord. Okay, abide to remain or continue. Okay, carry on with verse 4. The branch cannot itself produce fruit unless it abides on the vine. Likewise, you cannot produce fruit unless you abide in me. Verse 5. I am the vine. This is Jesus talking. You are the branches. The one who abides in me and I in him bears fruit, bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. So there it is. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and is, uh, that is dried up. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. This is gentle Jesus, meek and mild, by the way. So if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. Really, really important, okay? Uh, if you abide in me. So obviously what you're asking for is to do with abiding in Jesus. So it's not Ferraris and things like that. Okay? Anyway, Land Cruisers are better. So, okay. so last Sunday, uh, Kerry delivered an awesome message and she spoke about the prophet Jonah not wanting to do his assignment that God had given him. So essentially God had given a specific assignment to his prophet Jonah and told him to go to Nineveh and get the people to repent. Nineveh, incidentally, one of the most evil, um, vicious, violent cities in the world. It's, it's modern-day Mosul. I'm sure you know, all know what happened during the Iraq War there. Okay, so Jonah, he didn't want to do this, so he purchased passage on a boat going the opposite direction. <laughs> How many of us do that? So he, in other words, he did not abide in the Lord, all right? So once that ship was out, of sea, out at sea, the Lord wants him back. This is an assignment. It has to be done. If Jonah doesn't do it, he's got to train up someone else to do it probably short of prophets in that era. It's about the 8th century BC. So once the ship's out at sea, the Lord calls forth a great storm, and this ship is on the verge of being shattered. So the captain and the crew are terrified, heavy-duty sailors, big, strong men. They're all terrified, and they're trying everything to save the ship and save their lives. They're throwing things overboard. Um, they're praying for all of their individual pagan gods. Um, they all drew lots. They spoke to Jonah. And keep in mind, Jonah's the prophet of God, and Jonah actually responded to them and told them what to do about it, but they still didn't do it. They still carried on rowing against the wind, trying to row the boat against the wind. Rowing against the wind, in this instance, they're trying to row against the will of God. It's not going to work. You need big outboards and diesel engines for that at the very least. Okay, but they're trying to get to dry land, and of course, nothing is working. And the reason nothing worked was because they did not abide in God. Okay. They did not remain or continue in the Lord. 
So Jonah's refusing to do his assignments. All these sailors are not listening to what they're being told to do. Nobody on that ship is abiding in God. And verse 5 says, you can do nothing without me. So all these tough dudes, forget it. No point in rowing against God's not going to work. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and is dried up. That's where these guys are at. So eventually they're on the brink of perishing and eventually they all throw Jonah overboard and the storm subsides. Then the captain of the crew start making sacrifices to the one true God and obviously they're now grafted back onto the vine and their desires are being met. Like the desire is to stop the storm and that's what happened. But not Jonah. Jonah is still not abiding in God so God throws him overboard. You know, he's been thrown overboard. Big fish grabs him, swallows him up. He's in the fish for three days and ultimately he repents and gets on and does his assignment. He goes to Nineveh. Okay. So guys, we all have assignments. Those of you regulars here, you know that I'm always rabbiting on about our assignments. Doesn't matter who we are, doesn't matter where you are in life, where you've come from. Nobody is put on earth randomly for no purpose at all. We all have purpose, we all have assignments, we all have stuff to do, okay? And we've all been trained up for these assignments. God never lets, you know, throws us into the deep end or something we can't do that he wants done. God has planted natural gifting in all of our DNAs to give us the gifts or talents, if you will, to actually carry these things out. And we should all seek to be aware of what these things are. It's part of following God to figure out what are our assignments, why did God choose me, and how do I go about this? And as we always say, these assignments are always mission impossible. You know, Jonah, go to Nineveh, take on the most hostile city in the world and tell them they should be sorry. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so, but in order to achieve these then, if they are mission impossible, that's why we need to be grafted to the vine because we cannot do anything without Jesus. All right, so it all ties in together. So this series is called Look Up. Why that name? And generally speaking, because it's part of the human psyche or the human psychological programming, if you will, calendar, if you like, to drift off course towards the end of the year. It takes about a year for us to start losing interest. And by November, and certainly by December, we're all winding down. We're losing interest in work. Um, we're losing interest in school and university. We're all on holidays, focusing on holidays. We're putting things off until January. And very often our assignments and our intimacy with the Lord are the actual casualties of that. So the point is, at the end of the year, we're drifting away from abiding in the Lord. And given that as Christians, our perception of heaven and, and God is that it is up, that's why we want to look up early in the new year and start to follow Jesus again and get it all back into perspective, okay? So Pastor Paul and Pastor Kate know this very, very well. And if you go back and look at all the messages over the last 12 years, and I think I've spoken in January at just about every one of them. Uh, and... Um, I look and I can see the message is almost always the same, just in a different um, uh, way, but, but very much we're setting up the year again, okay? This is why it's kind of hard to find different content. Anyway, I'm going to talk to you about some interesting stuff today. So how do we get back on track? What uh, is looking up in a literal sense? What's that going to mean instead of a figurative sense? Okay, so it means to follow Jesus, to get back our prayer life, to get back into the Word of God to visit the 50 commands of Christ or re revisit the 50 commands of Christ. If you don't know those, just Google them. They'll come up pretty quick. Um, to get to know him even more than we did in the past. Getting to know Jesus is so, so important and lots of us don't do it well. Uh, and to consciously, consciously get back onto our assignments. So literally it means to follow Jesus again. And there's a whole lot of criteria um, associated with following Jesus. Uh, that most of you would know. It takes commitment, it takes practice, it takes training, it takes communication, that's communication with the Lord, it takes perseverance, sometimes you can't hear him and it drives you nuts when you're trying to figure something out. And uh, it takes patience, yeah, understanding, it takes positioning yourself correctly, um, it takes accountability, it takes support from others, it takes strategy, it takes knowledge of the bigger, broader picture, especially if it's your assignment and where does that fit in. And it takes making sure you're following the right Jesus and not some Fruit Loop cult figure, okay? So, guys, um, following Jesus always reminds me of my time in the Rhodesian Bush War as a tracker, especially this mindset of looking up. So most of you know I was in the Rhodesian Special Forces for 10 years, um, both in the SAS and in a very specialized unit called the Salu Scouts, which is where all the trackers were trained. So 
So from the time I was two years old, I grew up in Africa and I was literally a, a white black kid and I spent all of my time playing in the bush with the indigenous kids. My first language wasn't even English, it was Bemba. So I spent, uh, I learned the bush intimately and by the time I went to school, I knew the, the bush just very, very well and I was fluent in tracking and um, um, just knew all the animals, tracking animals, tracking people and so on. And that continued throughout my childhood and then throughout my adult life and throughout teenagers' years, obviously, and then adult life. And then when I became an adult, I was called up into the Rhodesian army to fight a really vicious terrorist war uh, for the next 10 years. So our country was being invaded by two massive armies, one of them trained in Red China, one trained in Russia, and we were outnumbered, I think it was 17 or 16 or something to one, and it was a big deal. We were being invaded, so it's kind of different to Australian wars. Australia's never been invaded, it's kind of different. You're a little more desperate. Okay, but every time these terrorists attacked our civilians or our military installations, those of us who could track were called in to track those terrorists, go and hunt them down and eventually engage in combat. And it was always, it was a bush war, so we, everything happened in the bush. It wasn't like an urban war the way you see Ukraine and so on today. These tracking events were called follow-ups, and um, sometimes follow-ups went on for a few hours, sometimes a few days, sometimes even weeks. We stayed on those spore for literally weeks, tracking, 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 until eventually we caught them, sometimes across borders, into other countries, hostile and so on. We didn't only track terrorists, we also tracked civilians a lot because terrorists abducted civilians and a lot of time those civilians escaped and then we were tracking them, they were lost in the bush, lost in the Zambezi Valley, lost in foreign countries and we were tracking them to try and rescue them, bring them home. Uh, other times we were tracking civilians who were collaborating with the terrorists, so if we follow them, we can find that they can lead us to the terrorist camps and so on. And oftentimes we were deep behind enemy lines in other countries, tracking civilians who also lead, or even uh, terrorists or young men who lead us to where the terrorist camps are, where they're getting trained. So the point I'm making, I guess, is tracking was a huge part of the Rhodesian bush war, and we pioneered a thing called tracker combat teams, and we became world leaders in that field. We pioneered, what we pioneered is now taught all over the world um, in, the, in the military world, if you like. Okay, so about five years into my military tour of duty, I wouldn't have called it a career, I don't think I was there voluntarily, um, I was asked to join the Salu Scouts. Okay, so I went from the SAS to the Salu Scouts, they asked me to come there as a tracking instructor. So, and eventually I took over tracking wing as the chief instructor and I ran all the tracking and survival courses for the whole of the Rhodesian Army, the Air Force, the Internal Affairs, Police, and then all of our allies, those countries that were allied, South Africa and what is now called Namibia. Okay, and actually it was while I was at tracking wing that I met my beautiful bride Merlene about 45 years ago and she and took advantage of my youthful innocence and led me astray ever since. <laughs> Uh, now, I'm telling you all of this war stuff, guys, because so, so many of the principles around tracking an enemy through hostile territory apply to trying to follow Jesus today in a hostile cultural world, especially in today's postmodern um, anti Christian woke rubbish society. Okay? So it's very, very similar. We have to be aware of so much more than just following Jesus 20 years ago when everybody was on our side. Okay, so for example, in the context of tracking, one of the hardest things that I found as an instructor is to teach my students to look up. The, 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 you, you cannot track close to your feet, okay? And um, when you're following tracks, you've got to look up. You've got to determine the passage of where someone went. You'll never catch up if you're looking for footprints and things at your feet. They just walk quicker than that. So you're just not going to catch them. You cannot track operationally like that. And we all have a natural tendency to look down. So we've got to cast our eyes way ahead, 10 meters, 20 meters, even 40 meters, depending on the terrain and the flora, whatever the restrictions are. So teaching people to look up on the, on the tracks is, is hard work. I'm always looking over because I'm walking right behind them and I can see the spore and I'm frustrated because I'm the, not the most patient creature on earth. And I'm what, looking at their eyes thinking, you know, <laughs> look up, look up. So it's the whole time, it's look up, look up and you're bumping them and nudging them, look up, look up, okay? So the same applies to Jesus, you guys. You cannot follow Jesus by looking down and gazing at navels and things like that. We've got to look up and make the effort and seek him out and search him out, right? So... Let's talk about tracking Jesus in the context of these tracker combat teams because we shouldn't be following Jesus on our own either. 
We need support. There's so much that goes with it. Let's examine some of these similarities. Firstly, and this is just a very strange coincidence, but the tracking wing was based at a very famous bush camp on the shores of Lake Kariba in the Zambezi Valley. Right in the middle of the operational zone, we had a training school, which was getting attacked all the time and so on. Anyway, um, that Salu Scout camp, uh, the bush camp, we also ran the Salu Scout selection course there, which was one of the most difficult and most grueling um, physical undertakings humans can ever go through. If you look it up and see, it's still regarded as one of the most crazy things. I had to do it. I did the SAS one, then the Scouts one. Scouts are much harder. It's madness. Anyway, so because of that, this camp had a Shona name. Shona is the uh, um, predominant di indigenous language in what was then Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. And the camp was called Wafa Wafa Wasara Wasara. And that means who dies, dies, who survives, remains. Isn't that interesting? Remains means to abide, okay? To remain is to abide. Remember John 15 verse six, if anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away. In other words, they die on the vine, the branch is cut off, wafa wafa, wasara wasara. Who dies, dies, who survives, remains. And that's just a coincidence, but it sort of lines up like, you know. I listed a bunch of principles a few minutes ago. Uh, training, practice, commitment, perseverance, communication, positioning yourself correctly, understanding, support from others, accountability, strategy, making sure you're following the right Jesus, knowledge of the bigger picture. So I'm not going to go through all of those. It'll just take forever and you'll be bored to tears. So I'm just going to take a few of them. The objective, the reason I tell little war stories and all make analogies and so on is so that we remember the message. Um, otherwise, I struggle to remember things and can't, so I just try and, you know, jazz them up a bit. But it's the truth. Okay, so look at a few of these, and then uh, if there's time, I'll close with a testimony from 2022, which is a wonderful year to forget for us. But um, uh, I want to prove the, this bit about uh, abide in my words and uh, ask whatever you wish, and I'll grant it for you. Okay, so let's talk about training. Most people, especially in this country, by far, most people have grown up in an urban environment. And even farmers, a lot of farm kids that, that I knew and, and farmers up on the Atherton Tablelands, we lived there for about 12 years, I guess. I used to teach them about the bush. These are farmers, about their own bush. I came from Africa, okay? Point being, growing up in urban environment on the farms, people didn't know how to track. They've never really known, and they have to be taught. And it takes experienced trackers to teach other people to track. It's not a textbook type thing. It's a very physical, and, and every... Even every little piece of bush you come across changes. The angle of the sun changes. All sorts of things change, dynamics change while you're tracking. It's not something you just write down and, okay, here's exactly what it is. You know, it's 24 degrees, we're going north, northwest, and the terrorists are wearing bare feet and no shoes. There's lots going on that you just learn with practice and, and training, and someone's training you and teaching you. And it's what happened to me when I was two years old. I was trained by indigenous guys who just knew how to track for centuries. Okay? So um, similarly, guys, it's the same with Christians. If, if somebody is just converted for, as a secular person into Christianity, they have no idea how to follow Jesus. They, they've got to repent and change from their sinful ways. So what does that mean? What's that look like? How do I do that? What can I do? What can't I do? There's 34,000 Christian denominations, all with different rules. Okay, Some says you can't have wine. Some says you can. Some says communion was, wasn't... Uh, you know, Jesus didn't make wine on the day of the first miracle. Some say, yes, it was. It was good vintage, etc. Okay, so they've got to be trained and, and taught all this stuff. And many times mature Christians who've drifted off track, maybe had a long holiday, it wasn't just November and December, they've all got to be trained again. So here in churches like ours, we have, you know, the Alpha course, we have the Bible college, we have the Sunday services where there's training constantly going on. Sometimes it's quite subtle, sometimes blatant. But it's teaching us all how to follow Jesus, how to track Jesus, how to look up and stay on track, okay? Practice. Guys, we've got to keep practicing and practicing and practicing following Jesus. Tracking is all about practice, practice, practice. It just, it just goes on and on. You never, every time you practice, you just seem to get better and better. You don't seem to get to a point and then you start coming down the other side. You just get better and better at it. Even with glasses, even as you get old, the wisdom you learn, the knowledge of how people operate, which animals do what, you just get more and more. You know, in 1993, the Australian SAS found out that I was living in Australia up on the Atherton Tablelands, and um, they asked if I would come and teach them to track in tracker combat teams, which we had pioneered. 
Um, so the Aussie SAS had been fighting a war in Somalia and they were tracking uh, warlords, the Somali warlords who were killing civilians and so on. Um, but they, and they were using Aboriginal trackers who were brilliant trackers. Uh, the indigenous guys in Australia are brilliant, brilliant trackers. Very dry country, so it's quite hard to track in dry, rocky country, but these guys are good. However, they weren't soldiers. So they're busy tracking and they track up close up to these warlords. They don't like just surrender, it's a battle. And the war just breaks out in front of them. And of course they get fearful, uh, they're not trained, they got, that's, most of them are unarmed. And ultimately, next time around, they start losing the tracks quite early, losing the tracks. They can see them blatantly, but they don't want to track into contact. So the SAS began to lose the opportunity to capture these warlords and so on. So they gave me a call and asked me if I would come and uh, teach them to track, and, and especially track in, in tracker combat teams. And they sent a staff car up to our house, and I got abducted down to the land battle camp in Tully to go and teach these dudes how to track. Um, but you know what, I hadn't tracked for 13 years, not, not operationally. A tracking doesn't leave you, I go and play in the bush a lot, I'm always tracking stuff. But I was completely out of practice because I had a job and was doing things or business. So I would have had to go back into the bush and practice and practice and practice before even teaching them. I was rusty, okay? Uh, I was just out of practice. And that's the big deal, guys. When we're following Jesus, we must not get rusty and out of practice. It needs to be a continuum. We should really abandon this human psyche of drifting off at the end of the year, I think. Our intimacy levels should rise at that point in time because we have more time. You know, there's holidays happening, so I think we should be taking prey days as well. You can do it on your jet ski. You can still have fun, okay? So, guys, don't get rusty. Keep practicing following Jesus. Positioning yourself correctly. As a tracker, following tracks or following the spore, as we call it, you, you've got to try and position yourself correctly on the spore. Spore, incidentally, it might be a new term to you, but it's very common in the tracking world. It's more than just footprints. It's the, the evidence of passage of whoever and whatever you're following. So footprints, uh, body imprints, like someone sitting under a tree, their butt makes a mark, or if they're, if they're lying down, where you come across a camp where they've been sleeping, you can see how many are there. Uh, imprints of the rifle butt leaning on a tree or crutches if they're wounded, um, disturbed or bent over vegetation, depressed stones and sticks where feet have, have pressed it down, extinguished campfires, broken spider webs, um, cigarette butts, food scraps, blood dripping like in the movies, what we call aerial spore. Aerial spore is just, you can see evidence of vegetation that's just been moved underneath a leaf is different to the top. You can just see it all and so much more. Okay, but when I use the term spore, that's what I'm talking about, the passage of somebody going through the bush. Now, the very best way to see the spore is to line it up so that you're tracking straight into the sun. You want the spore between you and the sun. So, because the sun reflects off the spore, reflects light straight back into your face and you can see where the enemy has gone or wherever the animal has gone or the civilian has gone. Okay, so the best time to track is east into the morning sun or in the evening it's west into the afternoon sun. Now, you can't always pick and choose that. In fact, you can't ever pick and choose that. So, but you can move off the spore and position it. If, if I'm going that way, let's just say it's north and the spore's going north, I'm tracking north and the, the sun is over to the east, I'm not going to walk exactly on the spore looking. I'm going to step off the spore and position it so that I've got some sun between me and some of that spore. And then, then it's, it shines up. If you get up early enough in the morning, go to a school, walk across the rugby field, uh, facing to, uh, walking towards the east and then also walk towards the west and stand there and look at those two tracks and you'll see blatantly you know, the Jews disturbed going to the east but you won't see anything going to the west. You won't even know people have been there. You have to go and stand on the western side and look back and then you can see them coming. Okay? So following Jesus is really important to position ourselves correctly, guys. You cannot follow Jesus if you're so busy that you don't position yourself to spend time with him. Yeah. It's just a, a lost cause, pointless. Okay? You might as well go jet skiing, enjoy yourself. Okay, same with reading his word. If you can't read his word because you don't position yourself to allow yourself time and so on, um, if you're harboring unforgiveness or any other principle, this is positioning yourself, getting rid of this sort of stuff, repenting from sin. Don't harbor unconfessed sin. Repent, get a, he'll forgive you as long as you're genuine. Okay, don't do it again, don't keep testing him. All of that sort of stuff, that is involved on how positioning ourselves to follow Jesus, all right? Following the right Jesus. As a tracker, it's really, really important to stay on the correct spore. 
we must not go wandering off chasing butterflies or going off onto the wrong spot. And the, the terrorists we are uh, tracking are expert bushmen, and they are anti-tracking. They want to lose us. They want to mingle and get into villages where, the, where, the, where um, people will walk over the tracks. They want to go where certain animals are, specific animals like zebra, confuse the tracker big time, uh, horses, asses, donkeys, and stuff like that. So these are things that that we have to learn how to stay on track and not be taken away. And we have various ways in the tracking world of, of staying on the correct spore. There's a, there's a technique called confirmation of spore. And the, what I would do if I'm, if I'm tracking people, I want to make sure I'm on the same tracks right in the beginning, early in the follow-up. I'm going to make sure I find a piece of ground that's nice and clear. And I'm going to stop there and I'm going to take a sharp stick and I'm going to put my foot forward. I'm going to draw a, a, cut a line in the sand behind my... Uh, my heel, then I'm going to take a normal step forward, I'm going to put another scratch behind my, my other foot. Now I'm going to stand back now, I've got a whole lot of feet footprints or spore inside, or tracks, inside what is a normal step from an average size, size I'm a bit more of a hobbit than average size, but I'm going to take a big step because I'm short, right? And in there I'm going to count all the heel marks because those are the most prominent part. People generally walk with their heel first. I'm going to count all the heel marks in there. That way I know how many people I'm, I'm following. Okay, then I'm going to write down what are the boot prints that I'm following. And, you know, we learnt and we knew every boot print that you could buy. These days your sneakers, there's quite a lot of different patterns. But in, in the war that I was fighting in the 1970s uh, and the early 80s, we knew the Russian uh, issue boots, we knew the Chinese issue boots, because that's what most of our enemy were wearing. But any shoe that was manufactured in Southern Africa, we knew about and we had it coded. So we could say, okay, there's four Russians, there's three Chinese trained, uh, two civilians, two barefoot. And the, the, billion, the civilians might be wearing what we call super pros. Do you remember the super pros, the tackies? So all the different shoes we knew, okay? And that we then stored. You, you remembered it. So you knew who you were following, okay? Then we got a, you also knew, I know if I'm following men, men or women by the slimness of their shoes. Um, even with sex changes, people don't cut their feet off and stitch men's feet on, so it's not going to affect trackers. Okay, but I can tell that I can, by the size of the shoes. I can generally see if it's a young adult or a child or whatever. Damage to the shoes, so sometimes the soles have got marks. A lot of these guys were wearing shoes for hundreds of kilometers. They weren't new most of the time. Uh, barefoot indentations, everybody's feet make different marks. Their arches are different, all sorts of things. So you learn all of that as you're tracking. You start to learn about the people you're actually tracking. You learn all of their ways. Okay, we knew how to date the tracks, date the spore. So I won't go into great detail on that because I'll leave a little bit of time for last year's nonsense. Okay, but for example, uh, we need to know how old the tracks are. Okay, I'm talking about following the right Jesus here in, in the context of tracking. So insects, I needed to know which, I need to know the environment, the gungen we call it. The gungen is a Shona word for the bush, the environment. Uh, nocturnal insects, diurnal insects, I need to know which ones are which. If I'm cruising along on my tracks and there's nocturnal insects have gone past, I need to know, well obviously they, they went here before that insect, so it must have been yesterday or, or, or last night at some point. It's not this morning, in other words, because that insect wouldn't dare come out in the day, it's going to get eaten, etc. Okay? So I, I can tell the certain times of the day, but I know what time birds operate, which birds operate. They're not all the same. Terrestrial birds, the ones on the ground, evening and early morning. You don't find them much on the ground during the midday, too much of a target. How long does it take different spiders to reconstruct their webs? All that stuff, we knew that fluently. How, how, how different grasses spring back, different times of the year, they spring back quicker, uh, and other times they don't spring back at all because they break off. Okay, I mentioned zebra and so on earlier. People mixing with zebra. I, know, I need to know which is your heel print and which is a zebra uh, hoof print. They very, most antelope in the bush are cloven hooved, but horses are single hooved, solid hooves. So zebras, donkeys, of which there were lots of uh, Rhodesias, <laughs> zebras everywhere, man. And the terrorists are going to walk through zebra tracks and they're going to go in front of zebra and let them chase the zebras over their tracks, all sorts of stuff. Recent weather, when it rained, how windy it's been, how long does it take for the dew to evaporate? If, if I'm tracking two-day-old spore and suddenly fresh spore meets, I've got to make sure that when they separate, I'm still on my spore. All that kind of stuff, okay? Talking about learning to track Jesus, making sure we're staying on the same Jesus, the right Jesus. 
So after a few hours as I'm tracking, I'm starting to learn who I'm tracking. I'm starting to learn all about them really quickly. And you get more and more fluent at it. You people, everybody has habits and, and different idiosyncrasies. Some have a left-hand bias, some have a right-hand bias, some have no bias. So in other words, the people left-hand bias, they're going to go to the left of obstacles. Right-hand bias, they just naturally tend to go to the right. Um, some people just bulldoze straight over obstacles, but you start to pick that, okay? <laughs> People are laughing. I don't. I'm, I'm delicate and sensitive and so on. Uh, some people stick to thick bush because they're frightened and they're hiding. Some people are just brazen out in the open and you could, they're just confident and, and I pick all of that stuff very quickly. Some people always take the shortest route. Some people take the longest route. Some people go the easiest route. Some people take really short strides. It doesn't take long to pick strides, how, how, how people are in a hurry or not. All so much stuff that, that's going on there which we we learn about who we're tracking, and that's exactly the same. So I know that I'm staying on track to the right people that I'm trying to find. Exactly the same with tracking Jesus. There are hundreds of things that can take you off the spore when you're trying to follow God. Okay, you can follow the wrong cult. People get led into the weirdest of cults, but they do. Okay, so they go off track pretty easy. Uh, following these homemade leaders who have no sort of institutional church structural accountability. That just about always goes wrong. I see so many of them start up and fall over and they were back in church two years later. Silly doctrines like not tithing, they, these things develop and disappear. You know, we, we need to know that we're following the correct 50 commands of Christ and, and absolutely stay on track, okay? Worshipping assets instead of the provider of the assets, which is mammon, which is so common. They've wandered off onto the wrong God, all right? So many, many things like that, guys. Okay, support team, um, I'll do one or two more and then give you testimony. Not boring you yet? No? Okay, support team, uh, like-minded people and so on. As an operational tracker, fully concentrating on the spore, uh, I cannot be looking around to see where these terrorists are going to ambush me and shoot me. Okay, it's not going to happen. I am concentrating on the sport. It's a massive job. You are, you are just so committed and so concentrated on what you're doing. And don't forget their anti-tracking, making it hard for you. So I need a team to protect me. So as a tracker combat team, we position flankers out. And they, and they go out. If the tracks, let's just say, in the, in the event the tracks are running straight, those flankers are out at 45 degrees. And they are walking, looking, looking, looking for where could the terrorists be ambushing. Because they often did dog leg back and ambush their own tracks to try and kill the tracker. Everybody wants to kill the tracker. If you can kill the tracker, they can go and play happily ever after. Okay, so trackers are prime targets. So the flankers are your support team. They are your eyes and ears as a tracker. They are trained, they are very, very alert people, really switched on, very, they, they're capable of tracking. They're not as good as the tracker, but they, don't, they can see the ground so they don't go stamping on the tracks. So if the tracks swing around, they usually know. Occasionally they, they, they walk over a tracker or pick it up pretty quickly though. Um, and their job is to keep the tracker safe, okay? So that's a support, um, uh, part of the support team. There's also a controller walking behind the tracker, and the controller is controlling the flankers and doing his job. I'll come back to him in a minute, but the fact is that the, he's part of the support team. And then sometimes, if you're tracking a big group of terrorists, sometimes we're tracking hundreds, and we're only four in a tracker combat team. Um, we have a big bunch of support troops. They might be 10 kilometers behind us, or five kilometers, or waiting back at the air base where all the helicopters are warming up. As we start getting closer and closer, we're not going to break contact. We're just going to go straight in, and then we're going to call in the support troops, okay? All right, um, so it's the same with following Jesus, guys. We need wise counsel when we're following Jesus. We need support uh, because it can be quite hectic sometimes. The enemy turns against you. You know, people come under attack, so to speak, spiritually and so on. All, everything's going wrong. We need support. We need um, to be able to ask people questions. We need Christian peers and friends, experienced Christians. We need pastoral care, all sorts of things like that. Okay, accountability, second last one. Um, that's the person, the, the tracker co uh, controller behind me. That's the person who walks immediately behind me. He's controlling the flankers um, and he's reporting back to headquarters uh, the, the spore report, number, direction, age and type. 
in, we call it NDUT, that's always going back, constantly going back to headquarters. So the headquarters can say, okay, number, direction, age, and type, we can see they're heading north, been heading north for two days, let's parachute some SAS guys in 30 kilometres ahead and go and ambush them or cross, uh, cross grain looking for tracks up there. So that's all bigger picture stuff, but the point is it's part of that um, accountability, okay? Following Jesus requires accountability. We have connect group leaders, we have ministry group leaders, we have pastors who are leaders and so on. Always a chain of command and accountability line. Keeps us following and on track, all right? Last one, quick thing, uh, communication, guys. Obviously, communicating with Jesus, really, really, really important. Um, as trackers and flankers and controllers, a tracker combat team has a unique language which we designed in Rhodesia. You cannot talk, you cannot make any noise, everybody wants to kill you, you're always outnumbered, so everything is done in sign language. And, and it's an intimate communication system. So every few seconds, the, the flankers have got to look back at the controller. The, the tracker is always communicating. If I've found spore, my hand is down. If I've lost spore, I do this, those flankers need to know, they go straight to cover. They mustn't start walking around, because I need to start casting 360s to go and find the spore. If I want a flanker to come to me, I'll point at him and I'll do this. That means come to me. If I want an officer to come to me, I'll touch my shoulders. It might be a, a lieutenant or a captain. I want him to come and talk to me. I'm just going to do this. Come here. If the terrorists are there, it's thumbs down. If I, pick the, if I know I've seen the turs or the flanker sees the turs, he looks back at me, it's thumbs down. Everybody's now ready for battle. There's so much dialogue and communication going on all the time, and it never breaks down. You don't just dawdle. No, nobody's in la-la land, even though you're tired and hot. Okay? And that's how it should be with Jesus. We should not drift off into la-la land in November. Okay? All right, guys, I've got six, seven minutes. I'm going to quickly give you a testimony. There's a whole lot more on tracking and how strikingly similar it is, but um, uh, we're out of time. Okay, so let's quickly have a look at what will God do if we abide in him. You know, my assignment, as most of you know, is to create a modern-day sheep nation in Australia. That involves building a big company, the big ministry that we built, and so on. So we did all of that. We built all of these things. But, of course, it ruffles a lot of feathers and hell, so we come under constant attack. The whole of 2021 and 2022, we came under attack from the corporate regulators, ASIC. They want to try to shut us down, okay? They're looking, are we a Ponzi scheme? We're raising capital. Do we have assets? They're just looking for all, anything wrong they can find with us. And you know, for the last two years, as they aggressively investigate us, it's overbearing. They want info, they want documents, they never let up. And we get worn out and frustrated and so on. It's very, very dangerous for us. But at the end of the day, you know, we stick to our assignments, okay? We stay on the vine and let God do the stuff that we can't do. And you know what happened when, when the ASIC investigation started? We had about $100 million of net assets in our mining company, which they were investigating. And we start, and our cap that we we're raising was getting close to that. As soon as you go over that, you're starting to border on a problem. Well, we can't fix that. We've got to be creating a sheep nation. So the Lord fixed it. You know, eventually when we took over the mine, we paid, a, paid 71 mil roughly, and we took over the mine. We found it was inequitable. We'd put in all the money. We renegotiated. We got 80% of the mine. All of a sudden now we've got, you know, a big chunk of the, of the previous value, the early value of the mine. Then a few weeks later, we had to revalue the assets because we're consolidating a mining lease. You've got to do that. We didn't intend to do that. We didn't know what it would come up at. Well, they revalued this whole mine, which had been set at 400 million. We had 80% now and it was set in 2013, it came in at $1.4 billion. We had 80% of 1.4 B. Okay, you do the maths on that. Then the last 20% of the, of the shareholders in the mine came to us and said, oh, can we roll up into your big pallet and hydrogen, please? And we said, well, how much do you want? They said 78 million. So for 78 million, we now rolled them up into 20% of 1.4 B. So we paid 78 mil for 280 mil worth of assets. Okay, we then owned 100% of this, this mine. Now, we didn't know money changed hands. It was script for script, share for share, done by fancy lawyers. At the end of the day, we never put any more money in. We started the year at $100 million, and now it was 1.4 B. That is giving you the desires of what you have to ask for as long as you're on the vine, and it should be connected to your assignment, which it was. We had to have that company, big assets. Okay, guys, I'm getting chased off the thing, just closing. Uh, Make sure this year, please look up, look up, look up. Track Jesus, abide in Him and He in us so that we all bear fruit according to our assignments. Wafa, wafa, wasara, wasara. 
Let's quickly pray. Holy Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to be in your house, to be part of the kingdom of God, the institution of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven on earth. It's so awesome and such an honor. Lord, we just love this church and the leadership and the pastors. We thank you for it. We thank you for its vision. We thank you that we can be part of that vision of winning the city over, saving, saving souls, but providing solutions, Lord, for the city and for the people of the city. And Lord, bringing the kingdom of God into the marketplace of this city and creating a sheep nation out of Australia as a benchmark for the rest of the world to follow. We honour you and just pray for everybody in this room now, Lord, that we actually start to follow you, to track you, that we never lose the spore. We get support, Lord. We learn the tracking cards, number, direction, age and type. And Lord, we just follow you until we find you. And Lord, then we abide in you and you and us and we will bear fruit for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.